So after the Iranian Revolution of 1979 took place, driving out the Shah, and eventually the Iranian students took over the U.S. Embassy, <clears throat> by 1980, the Islamic fundamentalist forces in Iran, led by Ayatollah Khomeini and his allies, managed to take control of the revolution, away from the more progressive factors who were pushing for a democracy. And Khomeini, as the leader, established the country's new name, the Islamic Republic of Iran, as an Islamic fu uh, fundamentalist country. And this changed a lot about how Iran functioned in a way that I'll come back to in a second. This is just a great picture of Imam, as some call him Imam Khomeini. Imam just refers to religious leader in Islam and Ayatollah as a title specifically to a high priest in Shia Islam. But what's cool about this, or at least interesting if not cool, is that this mural towers over the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. So uh, between 1980 and 1988, this is immediately after Ayatollah Khomeini and his allies have assumed control, Saddam Hussein, the president of Iraq, invaded Iran. Why would he do this? Well, it's a Sunni-Shia dispute. Iraq is primarily Sunni and Iran is primarily Shia, and there's a hatred there that's existed for hundreds of years. They had some old territorial disputes about who controlled what turf near their border. Um, so Hussein is also very concerned that the Iranian revolution might spread to his country of Iraq, and he does not want that, obviously. He wants to remain in power, so he wants to stop the revolution at the border, if you will. And Saddam Hussein is, is a greedy guy. He's a greedy and power-hungry guy, so he's interested in using Iran's moment of instability and weakness to grab some territory and get more power. He misjudges this, though. Um, he thinks, and so does Iran, that it will be an easy win um, for their side, but both sides are wrong. The war actually ends in a stalemate after eight years of fighting, and about a million people have died in both countries, and they both go back to their borders as they originally were in 1980. It's a really wasteful and tragic war. The use of martyrs to inspire Iranians to fight in the Iran-Iraq war is fascinating and very connected to this Islamic fundamentalist tradition and to Shia Islam in general. So here's one mural in Tehran entitled Martyr that's connecting um, being a martyr and dying for your country, as in the, the war with Iraq, being like the experience of Imam Hussein, who don't not to be confused with Saddam Hussein, but who is connected to Muhammad the prophet. Um, and here's another one in Tehran showing a fallen soldier in the war and on his headband it reads oh the shining moon of the tribe of hashim again referring to um hussein the third shiite imam so this is the the connection to muhammad the prophet during the war the iran iraq war from 1980 to 1988 the u.s actually supported iraq in the war why you ask um well a few reasons and this is in fact saddam hussein over here on the left uh, shaking hands with the U.S. president at the time. Well, because of the hostage crisis in Iran and the revolution itself, the U.S. lost Iran as an ally, right? You can't be allied with a country whose students have just taken your entire embassy hostage. And the U.S. needs another ally in the Middle East. It's a very important region, and we can't be friendless there. So we realize that it's time to cultivate our friendship with Iraq. We're also, like Saddam Hussein, afraid that the Iranian revolution will spread to Iraq and to the greater region. So we support Iraq by giving them money, intelligence like spying, military support. We allow Iraq to use chemical weapons on Iran in violation of international laws. And we encourage other nations to trade with Iraq and not with Iran. However, um, this period of history eventually results in something called the Iran-Contra scandal or the, the Iran-Contra affair. This comes to light in 1986, and this is the cover of Time magazine. Um, that's talking about the Iran-Contra affair, where Oliver North, um, this military leader for the U.S., is testifying that he was ordered by the president, um, President Reagan, to do everything that he actually did. What happens in the Iran-Contra affair is that the U.S., despite the fact that we are publicly supporting Iraq, are also secretly selling weapons to Iran through a um, deal for them to pressure the release of hostages in other places in the Middle East, not the Iran embassy hostages. It's a quid pro quo deal, but it means that we're actually supporting both sides of the war and are indirectly aiding the Iran who took our people hostage in 
1979. So this is politically disastrous. And how are we able to secretly funnel weapons to Iran? Well, it's because we are um, taking that money and then using the money from selling weapons to Iran to fund the Contras fighting in Nicaragua against the Sandinista government there, which is a whole separate proxy war from the one in the Middle East. And actually, it's a war that President Reagan was forbidden by Congress to, to fuel money to any further. So there's two illegal acts going on here, the selling of weapons to Iran and the funneling of money and weapons through those profits to the Contras of Nicaragua. It's an enormous scandal. Okay. <clears throat> So I need to pause here and explain that what's happening in Iran in terms of their societal and political and religious change is known as Islamic fundamentalism. And many people in today's society, especially in the U.S., think that Islamic fundamentalism is the same thing as Islam, that the folks who are preaching what they do in an Islamic fundamentalist society are speaking for the greater Muslim faith. And that could not be further from the truth. So I want to itemize how Islamic fundamentalism is not the same thing as Islam. Okay. The central beliefs of Islamic fundamentalism is that first, Islam is the only way. They are totally intolerant of any other religions or belief systems. This is not in keeping at all with Islam's larger beliefs. For example, Muslims who are not Muslim fundamentalists, just Muslims, the um, millions that exist in the world, I'm sorry, billions that exist in the world, would um, believe that the, that especially Jews and Christians, other religions, are so-called people of the book. There's actually, they're called that in the, in the Quran, and that it's important to be tolerant of others' faiths, and it's, you should only convert to Islam if you truly believe it. There's no real pressure to convert if you're not a true believer, and that there's a great deal of knowledge to be gained from other religions. Islamic fundamentalists do not believe this. Second, they also believe that their society should return to a quote-unquote pure time when Islam wasn't as corrupted by Western influence as it has now become, or so they say. In reality, there was no pure time. There was no time when Islam was existing in the world in this Garden of Eden state and everyone frolicked through fields and was happy. There's always been crisis and there's always been conflict in any society throughout world history, but there's this nostalgia of looking to the past. This is also problematic, this assertion, because Islamic fundamentalists famously use the internet to spread their message, they use modern weapons, they use airplanes, all of which are modern technologies. So this idea that they're going to return to the past is inherently flawed based on the hypocrisy of what they're doing today. And lastly, Islamic fundamentalists assert that they should everyone should interpret the Quran literally, and they claim to be doing so. In fact, they're not. The Quran prioritizes principles of peace and of love, and the spirit of the Quran is not in any way translated into um, the daily life of an Islamic fundamentalist society. How does an Islamic fundamentalist country work? Islamic fundamentalists want to combine religion and government. They want to create what are called Islamic states, that rather than using secular law, use Sharia law, which is just traditional Islamic law, as their governmental system. As an equivalent, imagine that in the U.S., rather than having the Constitution and all of the many, many laws that we have in this country, we instead had only the Ten Commandments as law, and there was no secular system at all. That's the equivalent of what they'd like to do in Islamic states and are trying to do. It results always in an Islamic fundamentalist society in a very cruel and unfair justice system and in the total repression of women's rights in addition to many other problems. Um, they also strive to limit the effects of modernization, but as I said before, this is inherently hypocritical based on their reliance of modern technologies. But they try to do this in terms of cutting back on schools, certainly in preventing girls from attending schools. Um, they also try to cut back on health care and um, trade with Western nations, any sort of thing that smacks of the modern world. And they also need to force anyone in their society to obey. There's no, oh, I'll voluntarily follow your laws thing in an Islamic fundamentalist society. Even if you are a Muslim and not a fundamentalist Muslim, or if you're not a Muslim at all, you will be forced to obey by violence if necessary. Why would people like this, you ask? Well, very few people actually do. Islamic fundamentalist represents a very small minority of Muslims because, as I said earlier, Islamic fundamentalism warps Islam in its um, true 
principles, especially its principles of peace. But for some, some fi might find this appealing because, first of all, it makes men feel very powerful. In Islamic fundamentalist societies, men have a great deal of power and control over women. So if you're a man, um, and that appeal, if you're a man to whom that appeals, and I would say that actually many men that does not appeal to, but if you are one who wants to exert more power over women, then this might, this might seem like a society you'd want to live in. Um, also. It gives people who are living in a very unstable, scary world, especially in times of great conflict, the feeling of comfort and safety, that there is a right way to be living, that there is a true path. And through this extreme order and discipline, they will be safe. Um, finally, Islamic fundamentalism is often just a red herring. It's just an excuse to justify an authoritarian or extreme political agenda. Um, and to do so under the guise of, oh, it's a religious belief, when actually it's just about justifying a dictatorship. Um, sometimes it is used to justify terrorism, as in the case of the 9-11 attacks. Few things were more disturbing, I think, for those of us who understand the difference between Islam and Islamic fundamentalism than it was to see people after 9-11 uh, equate the terrorists on that tragic day to Muslims, because they were not Muslims, they were Islamic fundamentalists who were giving a bad name to Muslims everywhere. Um, wearing the veil is an interestingly loaded event or act in an Islamic and Islamic fundamentalist society. The veil has become a symbol of the schism or the split between Islam and Islamic fundamentalism. It's actually a very small factor, but has taken on more symbolic meaning. In Muslim societies, uh, and for Muslim communities that are not fundamentalist, wearing the veil is a choice. It's voluntary. Some women wear it, some women don't. And actually, nowhere in the Quran does the text actually tell women to wear the veil. The Quran just instructs both men and women to dress modestly, and that's the way it's worded. There's no spe specificity around how you're supposed to put your hair or um, what kind of clothes you're supposed to wear. But you're just supposed to dress modestly, whether you're a man or a woman. In an Islamic fundamentalist society, though, the veil is not a choice. It's mandatory. And rather than wearing the more modest veils, on the left here you see a picture of a woman in a blue and white scarf. That's known as just the hijab, the very modest veil there. In the middle you've got the full um, body black veil called the chador. And on the far right, the women in blue whose faces you can't even see, that's called a burqa. In an Islamic fundamental society, the veil is mandatory and it's almost always, in fact, it's always the chador or the burqa, the two on the right. It's not usually the, the small hijab on the left. All right, so where does this leave us? Iran today, um, there's two central questions that we need to think about for where we're left with Iran. Iran, by the way, continues to be an Islamic fundamentalist society, but is by no means not the only one. First, Iran is developing nuclear energy. They claim, just for energy purposes, the United States claims they're doing so to develop nuclear weapons. It's unclear which, which it is, um, but there's some very strong evidence to support the claim that they are developing nuclear weapons. So we have to ask ourselves, do they have the right to do so in the same way that the US or any other power has the right to do so? Or would that be a disservice to the entire world and to the, the pursuit of world peace to allow Iran to create nuclear weapons. And if that's the case, does the US or the UN, for that matter, have the right to stop them from doing so? What happened the last time the US stepped into Iran? And does that mean we should never do so again? Does that mean we should only do so for certain reasons? And of course, the second question is about Iran's uh, political and social system. They have a real lack of democracy in Iran. And in the last 10 years and last five years especially, it's become more and more evident that Iranians themselves are are asking for political reform and for more democracy. What role should the US or the UN play in supporting those protest movements that are protesting against the Iranian government? Should foreign powers like the US or again the United Nations intervene to stop um, cruelty toward women or cruelty really toward anyone in the population? In other words, should do we have a role in Iran that's all about the pursuit of human rights or is the US place in Iran to stay out of it? Okay, I hope this brought you some interesting questions about where we're at with Iran today and how we should be thinking about the existence of Islamic fundamentalism still.